Look at that, Mike. We're live, pal. Uh, <clears throat> live on the Facebook, man. As I was talking earlier, that indexing and learning that position of the gun is the key for the optic, right? Before we have a bunch of people jump on, that was the, the epiphany is the angle there. You got to have the right angle. So, What gun is that? That is a SIG 320, Wilson Combat SIG 320 variant. You can see it's kind of dirty, but that's got the... It's beautiful. Is that brown or... I think that's green or brown lower half, whatever it is. Anyway, that's the little, they have a couple of different color variants, uh, variants. That's the Wilson Combat Grip module. So mm. so we're live on the Facebook, right? How's, the, how's that looking, man? We are. We've got 10 folks on already. Good morning and welcome to a Wednesday edition of, uh, Mike, what are, you, what are we calling this? Hey, folks, this is going to be a focus on manipulation, specifically the draw and the reload. So today we're going to be talking about speeding up your draw process and speeding up your reload process. Of course, this live stream was supposed to be last week, so my apologies. I had the flu or the COVID. I'm not sure what which. The COVID test was negative, but a lot of people say that false negatives are very, very, very common now so there's a very good chance i had a variant of the covid last week so i missed live the live stream last week and i'm a, still a little bit hoarse and got some stuff in the chest but uh, i'm good to go so folks sorry for missing last week hey we got a bunch of people on i know we are on the shooting performance page the american warrior center page the shooting performance uh, excuse me as well as the idpa page so good morning idpa facebook followers and likers and sharers of course my name is mike seeklin or i'm joined by my co-host uh, and Bill Silitaire, there in the background, behind the curtain, Mr. Rich Brown. Uh, today we're talking about speeding up your draw and reload, but I also want to kind of do an open Q&A. There's some things that I want to talk about and refresh your mind on in terms of the grip, because one of the cycles that we go through as we're going through these uh, Facebook live stream cycles is what I call GTS, which is grip trigger sites. And there's some key things about the grip that I think people miss you know, I post a lot of videos on Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, please give me a follow on Instagram. I'm putting a lot of really good short tips up there. But there's some key things that I talk about there that I think are misunderstood. So I want to clarify those as well. But before we get into anything at all, safety is the key. I know some of you are jumping on here. You're old school, old hats. You've been on here a lot of different times. So you understand safety. But if you are watching me on this live stream or joining along, please double check and triple check and make sure right now, you have no live firearms or ammunition on you or near you. If you are carrying a gun, maybe driving down the road and listen to this or at the gym and you have your carry gun there, that's fine. But you got to comply with the fact that no handling of live firearms or live ammunition during this dry fire live stream. So please double check and triple check right now. Also, all safety rules apply. Muzzle direction, trigger finger discipline, all the standard firearm safety rules apply. If you don't know the standard firearm safety rules, please Take a second to go to my YouTube page and watch the firearm safety rules or whatever else. We're going to have a nice, safe section. Of course, my session. Of course, my name is Mike C. Klenner. Uh, you can learn more about me by clicking on the link in the description on Facebook uh, or YouTube if you're watching this later on YouTube. As always, if you take one moment of your time right now and click the share button, I know Rich and probably uh, Chris on the IDPA side are clicking share. Last week, we hit 100 live viewers, which is fantastic. If we can 100 again, uh, that would be really uh, incredible. So I'd love for you to click the share button right now and see if we can get up beyond. We're already at 73 live viewers, which is absolutely crazy, man. Also, a few programs I want you to pay attention to. You can find them on the links in the, in the program or my site. The Competition Handgun Fundamentals talks in detail about the things we're touching today. Uh, as well as the IDPA Mastery Program that's on sale right now and a membership to the ACSS area. Or if you want to become a COIN member, you can join the American Warrior Society on the defensive side. My recommendation is that you do both because there are so many benefits in both areas that you cannot learn from, okay? We do have a couple sponsors today that I'll talk about real briefly, and I know Rich may have some uh, additional stuff he wants to add. Uh, this is actually the Cool Fire Trainer. I wanted to show you one of these kits very quickly. And if you buy a Cool Fire Trainer, go to coolfiretrainer.com. By the way, all those links are on the main page. Um, you're going to get a kit that looks like this. You're basically going to get a barrel. <clears throat> sorry, turn it the other way. You're going to get a barrel and a recoil spring assembly. So when, when you get a Cool Fire Trainer kit, you take your firearm, and I'll use this Beretta 92 uh, Wilson Combat variant, uh, the G model here, to show you. You're going to take the Cool Fire barrel, and you're going to put it in your gun. So you see the red barrel 
on the red marking on top of the barrel. That's the cool fire trainer. It already has the recoil spring in it. Inside the barrel is a striker system. So basically when the barrel's in the gun, you replace your barrel and your firearm, and then you take compressed CO2. So I have a canister of CO2 here. So let me go ahead and fill up the barrel. I'm going to fill up the barrel, right, with compressed CO2, just real quickly. It takes about two seconds to do this. So I'm going to pop this on. So now it has compressed CO2 in the barrel. Now, when I pull the trigger, watch what happens. Ooh, I get fell recoil. Okay. So, and that's, uh, you know, that's not a fully full, uh, full barrel of CO2. That's a partial barrel, barrel of CO2. Uh, if you keep your guns lubed and take care of it and install the cool fire trainer and have a lot of gas in your, in your barrel, right, you'll get 30 or 40 shots. Okay. So the cool fire trainer is one of our first sponsors. Pretty darn cool. If you, if, you, if you ask me. Also, Precision Holsters. I'm actually wearing their gear. I'll show you the signature line holster here in a second. Precision Holsters makes the mag pouches and holster that I use on a regular basis in competition. Um, they make the FAST holster, P-H-A-S-T, Precision Holster AC. Get it? Instead of FAST, it's P-H, FAST. Anyways, the FAST holster. Um, CEO John Marquez is a holster designing guru. He takes slow-mo videos of holsters and watches them during the draw process and then tweaks the holster to be even more efficient than it is, okay? So please check out those sponsors. And good morning, by the way. I see a bunch of people on. Good morning. Wow. Hey, good morning. Debbie's on. Looks like AWS on. David. Hey, David. Quinn member. Frank is on. Vicky's on. Gal is on. Chris is helping us share. Jesse. Hey, good morning, Jesse. Mr. Will Parker, coin members. Hey, if you're a coin member, go ahead and post your coin me member in the comments. Say I'm a coin member. There's a coin. If you don't have a challenge coin, consider getting one. Rich, we hit in six minutes and 28 seconds, 103 live viewers. It's awesome. Oh my gosh. That is fantastic. Like that is crazy. We, we've only hit 100 in the last few weeks in the last week's show. That's, that's impressive. So thank you very much for sharing. Okay. So let, let's, let's talk about this just a little bit. I want to talk about. <clears throat> A couple things first. First of all, I'm going to give you the tip of the day. Uh, the tip of the day has to do with uh, what I call the grip trigger sights in terms of counter rotating the hands and crushing the back of the gun. And the reason I want to go through this very, very quickly is I spent some time yesterday doing, you know, five shot drills at 25 yards. And the goal is at that distance to shoot the gun as quickly as possible and to maximize the recovery of the firearm, right? So when we're talking about uh, you know shooting a gun, shooting a handgun, we always talk about position and pressure. The position of your hands on the handgun are key because if the position of the hands on the handgun are in the right spot, then you can apply the right pressure. So in your mind, you should always be thinking position and pressure, position and pressure. But the pressure point that I wanna to talk to you about today is the counter rotation of the hands, right? And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a kind of a weird visual where I'm gonna cover up my face from the camera for a second, but I want you to watch the palms of my hands here, right? So when I'm talking about counter rotating your hands at the end extension of the handgun, and by the way, this is one of the key secrets to recoil control. So if you wanna dramatically improve your recoil control, try this on the range. But what I'm gonna do at the end of the extension is, I'm gonna counter rotate the hands and I'm gonna clamp or crush the back of the gun. Now watch when I'm doing this, this hand is rotating like this. The rotation actually occurs in, in the wrist. A lot of folks try the rotation in the arm. It's not necessarily the arm, it's actually the wrist where I'm counter rotating the hands. So this counter rotation of the hands, when I'm rotating this wrist this direction, and this hand this direction, automatically increases the pressure between the palms of my hands and the back of the gun right? So that pressure on the back of the gun is what really truly controls the recoil. Think about this for a second. The more pressure I have on the back of the handgun, right? Here, high on the back strap and on the back of the gun, the more recoil control I'm going to have. So the next time you're at the range, I don't, you don't have to draw, you don't have to complicate this, do it nice and simple. I want you to load a magazine of, you know, 10 or 15 rounds, whatever you have. And I want you to work on extending the handgun. And at this last bit of an extension right here, once my grip is together, now I'm going to take my hands, I'm going to counter rotate them, and I'm going to crush the back of the gun and fire a shot, right? I'm going to crush the back of the gun and fire a shot. Crush the back of the gun and fire a shot. So play with that one round at a time for a while and watch what the gun does in recovery. If you do this right, the gun will almost shoot flat. So if you go to my Instagram page, go to mike.cclanner, check out my Instagram after this live feed, watch the gun during my five shot drills. The gun is in essence, 
flat. It does not recoil. All guns recoil and move. That's not necessarily true. But the point is, it's very, very flat. Once you get it down one round at a time, then I want you to load up five rounds at a minimum, right? And I want you to work on extending the handgun, building your grip, counter-rotating your hands, right? And firing five shots, right? By the way, if you're just jumping on 125, 125. Did I see 125 live viewers, Rich? Yes, that's correct. 125. 125 live viewers. That is absolutely insane. That's crazy. If 125 of you share this, maybe we'll break the Facebook algorithm again. By the way, if you're wondering how this gun is, is cycling, this is a Cool Fire Trainer. It's one of our show sponsors. You can check them out. Coolfiretrainer.com forward slash c -clan. So anyways, Rich, that was my one tip for the grip. Uh, any questions popping up so far or anything I need to address before we start talking about the draw? And I want to give some secrets to speeding up your draw. I'm not just going to teach the whole process. If you've seen me live, you know the draw process. You can go back to a bunch of different videos. But I want to talk about some keys to the draw process, okay? Yeah, we got a couple of questions popping in, Mike. And before we get to them, I'd like to thank IDPA for putting this on this morning. Thank you, IDPA, for putting this on this morning. And by the way, IDPA, I know she's sitting there. Chris is our little IDPA helper. She's sharing like crazy, probably sharing all over the place, which is why we got 120 some live viewers on, man. Yeah, Elkie says, aren't we actually rotating our hands toward each other to the grip? Counter rotating would be moving hands in opposite directions. Yeah, good question, um, Mr. Elkie. I'm thinking you're out in Colorado, Colorado right now. I hope your weather's awesome out there. Hey, so the, the point here is um, when I say counter rotating that to means means we're rotating in opposite directions maybe that's not the right terminology but the point is if this hand is rotating like this i'm rotating in this direction in my wrist this hand is rotating like this so if this hand is rotating clockwise this hand is rotating counterclockwise i would call that a counter rotation right uh, so the counter rotation i suppose you could go the opposite direction that's still a counter rotation but in my mind the way i'm describing it is the counter rotation is like this which increases the pressure in the back of the gun by allowing you to crush the back of the gun with the palms of your hands. So hopefully that answers your question, Bella. All right. You ready for the next question? Yeah, let's do it, man. All right. This gentleman, uh, I can't pronounce your name, sir. Mahaya says, Mahaya. I have a question regarding the clamping. Somehow I end up with hands fighting with each other near the back of the gun and often first shot, the left one gets pushed forward. Don't know exactly where to put the support hand, so leaving enough room for the clamp. So let, let's talk about the support hand. Let me and let me be um, let me be as specific as I possibly can. Oftentimes, I will use the term "get the get the hands on the back of the gun." My my point on doing that is to try to get the end user to focus on applying as much pressure on the back of the gun as possible. Right now, we all know with with my strong hand. The palm of my hand is in contact with the handgun grip. That's going to be natural because my strong hand, my right hand is gripping the handgun. Uh, the concept of flagging the thumb out of the way is what opens up the grip. So if you look at how my thumb is open and flagged, watch how this opens the grip panel up. So it doesn't open the entire back of the gun open because my right hand is there. But it does open enough where when I index this hand, the support hand under the trigger guard, I can truly drive the palm of my hand into the back of the grip. So if I were to move my strong hand, notice it's not just here, right? My support hand is not here. It's here, right? Now, normally my strong hand would be in position here, but the point is by counter rotating, hooking these three fingers, there's your good angle. Now I can take that palm and I can push and drive in the back of the gun. So I'm putting pressure there. Now, um, if that was um, me, Mihai. Mihai, is that right? Mihai, if that is right, give me a thumbs up if we pronounce that right. Maybe it's not. Anyways, the point is if your hands are slipping, right, your support hand is slipping off the gun, that tells me that you've tried to falsely rotate it forward or you haven't figured out where to pressure the gun with your left hand. So if you figure out how to pressure the gun with your, I should say support hand because it could be uh, Mihai, sorry. Um, it could be your opposite hand, right? But the point in the pressure and position is the key thing. So play with that a little bit. And that's one of the things that I want to tell 122 live viewers right now. A lot of us are shooting and reacting to what the gun is telling us visually. So we're just aiming the gun. We're always looking at the sights. We're always we're always uh, reading the information that we get from the sights. You should you should focus on feeling what the grip does on the handgun. So when your hands are in contact with the handgun or your, your body's in contact with the rifle, we could talk about a long gun. It's the same concept. It's kind of one of those key little secret trick areas. Pay more attention to what you're feeling, 
okay, initially than what you're seeing. What you're seeing is super important as well. Don't mishear me on that. But what you feel is critically important because what you feel on the handgun or the rifle or whatever else in terms of pressure and position, that's the first piece of information you get from the firearm, not visually. Visually is the last piece you get from the firearm as you aim the handgun and fire it. Think about that for a second. So if you're paying attention to what you feel, be high end, and getting your hands in the right position, that'll help. So I would tell you, first of all, rotate that left hand a little farther back and then work on clamping the back of the gun and applying that pressure and just do it one shot at a time. You don't need to fire multiple shots. Don't need to fire two shots or three shots or even five shots like I would do in the fundamentals program. Uh, just fire one shot at a time and watch how the gun recoils, you know, and returns. Build that grip, you know, you know, fire your shot, watch the gun. Build your grip, fire your shot, watch the gun. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, Johnny has a question, Mike. He says, what about while we do that, we also squeeze as well with both hands, question mark? Yeah, good question, Johnny. So, uh, of course, you're squeezing with both hands. So, the, the description of my grip would be, um, I'll show you without the gun because I think that'll be interesting. The description of my grip might look like this, where I'm gripping with my fingers and my hands, right? But I'm also, while I'm doing that, I'm using the extension of my arms and the rotation of my wrist to solidify and build that last little bit of pressure at the end. So the last little bit of pressure, I'm driving the palms together. And by gripping hard, gripping hard automatically locks the tendons up in the wrist right? So if I lock the tendons up in the wrist, the only thing else I got to worry about is locking the elbow tendons and then making sure my body posture is proper. So if you look at my upper body posture, I don't want to go too far down this road, but if you look at my upper body posture when I'm shooting, it has to be slightly forward and behind the gun. If my upper body is upright, and I see a lot of shooters do this, a lot of folks on Instagram, a lot of really good shooters, believe it or not, have this very upright kind of stance where they brace that foot back and they get the upper body like this, if I have the wrong upper body posture, the gun will have leverage against my upper body. Look at my upper body. This is not correct. This will never give you the recovery you want. That upper body needs to be slightly forward. So notice how I'm taking that lower body and I'm rotating it to the rear, sticking that butt out just a little bit, and then get, getting the upper body behind the gun. Right? So that's your position. 130 live viewers, which is freaking fantastic, man. That's incredible. All right, Mr. Rich, any other questions? And we'll talk about the draw a little bit. No, Johnny says, perfect, Mike. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Hey, folks, man, 120, 30 people on. This is absolutely incredible. Um, I'm going to take a sip of my water. If you're if you're here, welcome back. I'm sorry I missed the live stream last week. If you like this or learn from these, give us a thumbs up or give us a share and let us know in the comments right now. Hey, I really, really like this. Is that Mr. Jason Shared? Man. Jason Shared, like Jason Shared from Knoxville Police Academy, my partner in crime, the president of the class. I think I was his vice president in the academy, Jason. Who's now, I, I believe, a full-time professional pilot, brother. Uh, 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 Dr. Botson is on. He says, Facebook's playing games again. Wouldn't link to the video from the notification. Well, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. That's crazy, Mr. Zuckerberg. Come on, help us out. We're talking about firearm safety here. We're teaching firearm safety and basket weaving. Maybe that's how, how, we, how we should put it on, firearm safety and basket weaving. Hey, by the way, if you're on Facebook Live right now and you know Gordon Ryan down in Austin, Texas, I want you to give Gordon Ryan a shout out. Tell him to come up and shoot with me. He was talking about his new gun on Instagram. And I'm like, hey, man, I know a guy that can help you out. I just want a couple of your back defense choke tips. Whatever no doubt. All right. Hey, uh, Mr. Rich, I don't see anything else. Folks, if you haven't, please do me a favor. Click the share button. So let's get into this while you're clicking share. Let, let's talk about the draw process itself. And then we'll do, I want to, what I really want to do is I want to focus on what's going to help you speed up the draw. And I'm going to talk a little bit about chunking today. Okay. Um, so in terms of the draw process, when we talk about the draw, we always talk about a few principles. Number one, when I draw the handgun, both of my hands move at the same time, right? Okay, give you a different angle there. They're both moving. Okay, I'm not going to leave one hand what I call lagging. If my left hand lags down here, then I end up chasing the gun off at times. And by the way, th there are different variations to the draw. If you watch Rob Latham draw, he does have a little bit more of a lag in his support hand, right, where he meets after the hands start moving. If you watch my hands, my hands start moving initially, and I try to get my support hand into a position here. When the gun drives by, I can very easily chop under the trigger guard. We call this an index point. And there are three key index points, by the way. There are three key index points that I want you to pay attention to. And this is your, this is your first 
Speed tip for drawing. So listen to my words right now. If you're not paying attention, hear my words. You are gonna feel contact between your hand and the handgun before you're gonna see or get a visual reference if you're doing it right. So if you feel the contact and the indexing in your hands on the gun before you're gonna see the sights when you aim it, which one gives you the information first? You should be saying, well, Mike, feeling what my hands are doing on the gun gives me the information first. And by the way, this is applicable in uh, competitive shooting or defensive shooting, it doesn't matter. If you pay attention to what you're feeling on the handgun, that is a key piece of information. That's your secret of today. So let me let me talk about what I'm what I mean by feel. So when I'm drawing the handgun, index point number one is the hand in, in, indexing in the holster. So what I mean by this is when I actually draw the handgun, I'm going to attack the gun from the rear, right? And the second the hand hits the handgun, I get information. So right now I just got information in my brain based on what I'm feeling. I can't see the handgun. I can't aim the handgun, but I can already feel what's going on in terms of the grip building process. What I mean by this is I can tell right now in index point one if the handgun is indexed or oriented in the right direction, right? And if I know that the gun is indexed or oriented in the wrong direction, I can start to solve the problem by doing a slight rotation of my hands. So that is index point or fill point number one. Practice indexing or attacking the gun from the rear and then feeling how the gun lines up in the web of your hand. Now, for those of you that were taught, well, Mike, you have to have the gun lined up with your arm. That's not true. If you look at how the handgun is and when I'm actually gripping the handgun, you're going to learn a couple of things about me right away. Number one, that I'm left eye dominant. Okay. And number two, that the handgun is not lined up with either of my arms. It can't be because the arms are attached to my shoulders on the outside of my body. So there's no way the handgun can be lined up with the wrist of the arm. That's a false statement if you saw that somewhere, okay? So index point number one, I'm attacking the gun from the rear, and I'm feeling how it's going. I can feel the grip building process. Now, the gun comes out of the holster, right? After the gun comes out of the holster, I immediately drive by my support hand, who's ready. This support hand is kind of hanging out waiting, right? He's ready to receive the gun. The second the gun drives by, I'm going to index or chop into the trigger. This is index point two. So once again, now I'm feeling how the grip building process is going. I immediately get some sort of uh, physical sensation in my hand. And I can tell if I touch the right spot on my index finger that the grip will build and rotate into the handgun perfectly. If I touch the wrong spot on my index finger, then I will overgrip the handgun, my hands will not rotate together, or I'll undergrip the handgun and I'll have a gap between my hands. So you need to figure out and understand where you need to touch this index finger, I call this the Judy chop, by the way, under the trigger guard. So how do you do that, Mike? Well, you build a full and perfect grip where your hands are in the right place on the handgun. And then you can simply unwrap that support hand and you could pay attention to where that index finger touches the trigger guard. So that's index point number two. So once again, I'm feeling my grip in the holster. Is it going good or bad, or do I need to make an adjustment? Then I'm going to feel the second hand touching that index point. If I touch the right spot, I know the grip building process is gonna go good. And then last but not least, I'm gonna feel index point number three. Index point number three is where these two hands rotate together. So you look at the curve of my thumb and the curve of my thumb, those two curves should come together and that allows me to feel whether or not the support hand is gonna go in the grip on the handgun grip like it should, or if I need to make some sort of rotation positional uh, change on the gun itself. So that's your first tip in terms of speeding up your draw process. Work some dry fire draws and play with feeling through the draw process where your hands are going on the handgun. And here's the end point, okay? And then I'll do some Q&A and answer some of your questions for you. If I've worked on feeling the handgun grip, by the time the handgun gets there, the dot of the sights are there. That's the point. The point is if I'm feeling what I need to and adjusting as I need to, the dot or the sights are right there. So literally, the dot was right there. There's a small target behind my camera and I've got a pin in it, a little teeny tiny thumbtack. So I'm looking at that thumbtack when I'm drawing this and paying attention to what I'm feeling, 
on the handgun, the thumbtack is hit immediately with that dot. My dot with my uh, optic sight is right there, okay? Feel, feel, feel. Grip the handgun. And of course, then you're gonna counter rotate the hands and do all the same things we, we talked about earlier, okay? Mr. Rich, I gotta have a sip of water, dude. Well, first of all, we got a, an amazing international crowd this morning. I've seen South Africa, our friend Manhar is on. He says, hi all from South Africa. Mike, I use your training methods and it works great. Now I don't have to think about it and I draw quickly and correctly. And um, we also got Sweden on this morning, the Philippines on this morning. We got a lot of folks in the house. And the question that I throw to you, Mike, is from Nova. Nova yep. says, do you find these principles apply well to the defensive draw as well, other than moving your cover garment out of the way? A hundred percent. Yeah, Nova, there's absolutely no different. And I, I have a vest that I may put on here a little bit later on in the live stream. But, you know, if I were drawing from, you know, as you may know, Nova, excuse me, I carry in the appendix position. So if I reach down, I, I swept my shirt out of the way and I tack the gun from the rear in the appendix position, what I'm feeling there is exactly like what I'm feeling in the strong side holster for competition gear. So how I feel and what I feel is exactly the same in a defensive context type draw versus a competition co context draw. Because in wherever you carry you know, your defensive handgun, when you attack the gun, you should be attacking the gun from the rear. You're automatically, you know, getting that index point. I'm feeling that grip building process. Um, it, it's the same exact feeling process. And by the way, if you're just jumping on Facebook right now, joining us, we're talking about learning how to speed up your draw uh, via index points and, and understanding that the first information you get from your handgun is what you feel your hand's doing versus what you see. Most of us, are too focused on the visual aspect of shooting. And I'm not saying that's not important, but we forget about the, the kinesthetic, the feel process and what we're feeling on the handgun itself. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm advocating today. Um, in this Mike, line. we almost hit 150 a little while ago, but uh, we got people from oh. Finland on Switzerland. We got the Republic of Texas is on. Finland, man. I would love to go teach a class in Finland. Republic yeah. of Texas. Yeah, that's Mr. John down there. Nice to see you. Thank you. And by the way, right, right, I see Randy's coming. Thank you for watching. Do we have any questions I need to address? Yeah, you? ready? Yes, sir. Dallas wants to know how do you compensate for small handguns in your grip? Boy, I get this question every single time, don't I, Rich? Like yep. literally every single live stream. So, so let me let me show you this. This is a smaller grip. It's not a lot smaller. The handgun grip size it is not. How do I say this properly? The handgun grip size does not change the principles of what I'm doing on the grip. So no matter how small the grip is, I'm still attacking the gun from the rear, right? I'm still flagging the thumb to keep it out of the way, to open up this part of the, uh, the actual handgun grip, and I'm keeping this open and exposed so when I get the second hand into position on the handgun, whether it's this grip size in this teeny tiny gun, right? Or a full size grip size in a much larger gun, it's the same principle, nothing changes. Now, the bigger your hands are and the smaller the grip, the harder time you're gonna have making some of that contact, but that, that's the point with the smaller grip, which is why oftentimes when we compete or we have the choice, you know, we, we shoot a larger grip size or a larger gun because we can get more purchase on the handgun itself. But from a principle standpoint, to answer your question, it doesn't change the grip building process and I'm still applying the same pressure to the gun itself. Awesome, Mike. And a man says, if you could show us how to draw on those speed holsters and Ipsic. Speed holsters and Ipsic, man. All right. I'm not sure you're gonna have to give me more details on that. It's, 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 uh, I, I would assume you're talking about an open holster that doesn't have the thing. Here's the deal. Any strong side holster, right? And man, if I'm, if I am, uh, not understanding the holster type, let me know. But if I have a full open exposed holster, like the old school uh, CR speed holsters, the ghost holster that Frank Garcia kind of promoted for a while, um, a lot of different holsters don't cover the gun at all. I left those holsters years ago because I got sick of my gun falling out of those holsters. But the point is that the, the distance that I have to pull the gun out is just shorter than with this holster. With this holster, I have to pull it all the way out to here, right, before it releases. The distance is simply shorter. So the second I release the handgun from the holster, it starts driving in a straight line. And by the way, that's another key tip to your draw speed. And I know this will help Manhar as well as everybody else. 
when we talk about drawing the handgun, I talk about straight lining to my students. So the second the gun is released from the holster, I'm actually going to drive the gun in a straight line to the target. I'm not going to bring the gun up and out and try to aim earlier because you can't. You can't aim the gun earlier because the gun is at the wrong angle. So don't try that. That's a, that's a mistake that will cost you time in your draw, draw process. So when you're drawing the handgun, the most important thing you can do is, is straight line. I'm going to grab the handgun as fast as I possibly can and straight line it to the target. Okay. Um, also, in terms of drawing the handgun, make sure when you're doing your motions and your movements, if you want to speed up your draw, think about chunking the draw. And I, I will we'll break this down a little bit more detail. So in terms of drawing, how do we draw the handgun? Well, step one is we, we index the handgun in the holster, right? So I'm attacking the gun from the rear. I'm bringing my support hand into position. So if I wanted to chunk, like small chunks and practice the draw process, I might simply work on step one of the draw 50 times in a row. I may work on this 50 times in a row. And I'm working on moving my hands and not my body, attacking the gun from the rear. I'm feeling this every single time. And by the way, I just saw your comment, Jim McCafferty. Thank you for watching if you're a first time viewer. So what I'm doing is I'm just chunking that portion of the draw. And if you want to, you know, add something to it, well, maybe I'll start with the surrender position, right? Right. Maybe I'll work on hands on barricade. All I'm working is attacking the gun from the rear, okay? Holding a, you know, a rake, whatever they might have you do on a stage. You can work on that small chunk of the draw process. And then maybe step number two is you start from there and you pull the gun out and you index, right? And you index, right? And you index, right? Index, right? Index. And what I'm working on here is touching and feeling my thumbs together, right? Touching and feeling my thumbs come together. Okay? Where's the dot? Where's the dot? Where's the dot? Where's the dot? You understand? So now what I'm doing is I'm repetitively chunking the position of the gun so I can see the, the dot, in, in this case, in an optically sighted handgun, optically sighted handgun, Faster. If you're shooting iron sights, it would be the same thing. That was kind of a long answer for Manhar. I don't know if I answered your question for Manhar. Um, yeah. So, Mike, you ready? Yeah. Paul says, evidently, Paul's uh, just getting on. He said, You said something about counter rotation on the grip and shooting. Could you please say that again? I will, Paul. We're talking about, and I'm going to give you a different angle here. Once I establish the proper position of my hands, right? I'm always thinking about pressure but I'm simply taking my palms and I'm counter rotating them. So this, this wrist, uh, this hand, I'm moving at the wrist and I'm rotating in my hand like this and driving the palm in the back of the gun. This hand, I'm doing this and driving the palm in the back of the gun. And when I put them both together, that allows me to counter rotate and increase, increase, increase the pressure on the back of the gun. And uh, when we do that, you dramatically improve your recoil control because you increase the pressure here, which is the most important spot that you can put pressure in the hanging grip. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still gripping with these fingers. If it was Paul that asked that question, but I'm counter rotating the hands and driving the palm. So my end extension of my grip on the process is that counter rotation of the hands when I fire those shots. By the way, that's a cool fire trainer. If you're wondering if I'm shooting um, holes in my wall, I'm not. At least not today, I'm not. Uh, Mike, we had a couple of folks on here from Israel. One of them said, we love you. I'm assuming they're talking about me. So I appreciate yeah. that, sir. Thank you very much. Hey, we have 152 live viewers, dude. That's that's, crazy. that's amazing. Then the new goal needs to be 200 next week. All right, 200. Got to hit 200. Maybe we'll do that. Our good friend, Big Steve Washington is on. Good morning, Steve. Tyler says, how do you manage support hand finger grip when your hands get sweaty or sticky or slick? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in terms of my, so the position of my hands is really important. I will tell you this though, Tyler, if you play with the, the, the position of your hands, I'll give you a great example, Tyler. Oftentimes what I'll demonstrate to my students is I'll show them the full grip of the handgun and I'll fire a couple shots. Then I'll take my support hand and I will open up my support hand. So now I can't even grip the handgun but by opening up the support and I'm showing them the importance of pressuring or driving the palm in the back of the gun. So all I'm doing is I'm taking my support hand and I'm pushing into the back of the gun. 
and I'll fire a couple shots. And what they'll see is they'll see recoil control that's very similar to when I'm gripping the hands with, with, with like the normal grip, a, a, a proper grip by opening that finger. Because what it's showing them is the importance of the position of my support hand and the importance of the strength of my strong hand. So if you start to play with the positioning of your hands and get your hands in the right spot, I would submit to you that when your hands are wet or sweaty or whatever else, you will still have better recoil control than you might if you didn't have the proper position of your hands. Of course, anytime, excuse me, we lose a little bit of friction on the handgun, we are in fact going to lose friction on the handgun. Your grip is not going to be quite as good as it would be. You know, in the competitive environment, we can use little cheaty tricks like, you know, shock or, or pro grip or, you know, those different variants and things they sell. What's, what's actually, they actually help you, you keep from sweating in your hands and it dramatically increases the friction between your hands. I don't rely on those a lot anymore these days because of the pressure position of my hands. I work so much on my grip. I mean, I just literally spent hours in the range, gripping the handgun, boom, boom, firing a shot. Gripping the handgun, firing a couple shots. And I watch what the gun tells me and I'm constantly working on that pressure. Once you figure out how to control the handgun recoil, or the recoil of the handgun with your whole body, your hands, your wrists, your arms, and you put it all together, uh, being a little sweaty or a little bit wet is not as uh, big of a deal as, as it could be. Okay. Well, and you also carry those uh, grip strength things in your truck and stuff. I mean, you're waiting at the traffic light. You can work on that, right? Yeah, I do. You know, if I don't have one near me. You know, they make the captains of crush makes those. I'm a big, big advocate of working on your grip strength. But here's the, I'll give you the secret of the day. The very best way to work on your grip strength is by shooting or dry firing. If I were sitting here, and let's say I did 100 reps of this where I grip the handgun, dry fire. Grip the handgun. Dry fire. Watch my forearms. Grip the handgun. See how it's, I'm tensing, right? So I've just maxed them. I literally gripped the gun as hard as I could a hundred times in a row. You don't think you're going to get stronger? Of course you are. And guess what? If you're a jiu-jitsu guy or gal, then it's going to help you with that as well. Randy says, what belt and holster do you use? I had an open holster. It was a pain in the butt and felt like I could not get my belt tight enough. Yeah, so Randy, um, so the, I strongly recommend you check out Precision Holsters. I brought two different rigs. This is my USPSA setup rig that has an inner and outer Velcro belt. Um, that's actually the Seaclander Signature Line belt and the clamping system that I mount the holster with. The holster and the belt system that I have on right now, this is actually an old school Velcro belt that I ran through the belt loops. It's a very stiff belt, but I also have, I'll show you another one. The other one I use is a stiffer version of the Precision Holsters belt. This is my carry belt. So it's a very stiff belt, but this is, <clears throat> excuse me, not quite stiff enough for me to compete with. So check out Precision Holsters if you're looking for a good belt and setup. If you are a competitor, and you want a Precision Holsters belt, then ask John to send you the stiffer version, the IDPA version, uh, because it's stiffer, it's thicker. You want the thickest, stiffest belt you possibly can. Because if you look at the gear, and there's a great gear video we did on the, not last week's show, but the week before. Go back and check that out. My holster doesn't move. It's not sliding. It's not moving. And then in this case, you know, if I need to have one more kick on my belt, I just pull a little bit tighter. It's a Velcro belt inside my bell loops and I'm good to go. Okay. So that's the one I'm using right now. All right. And John says, what is your strong hand wrist doing when you draw from appendix? Is it getting back pressure to create an angle toward the target? Strong hand grip wrist doing when I draw from appendix. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, John. Um, I don't, I wouldn't describe it as doing anything different than my, my strong hand wrist is attacking the gun from the rear. If my gun were in the appendix position, right? I use this gun for demonstration. The gun angle wouldn't be like this. It would be like this, right? Okay. So when I draw the, the gun from the appendix position, right? Nothing changed in terms of the wrist angle and the gun position. So it doesn't anything different, John. There's no secret pressure there that I could explain to you that would probably make a difference other than what you know. It's 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 I'm simply attacking the gun from the rear in the same manner, if that makes sense. All right. Jeff says, on the draw, are you pulling straight up and and completing? I'm sorry, are you pulling straight up and completely clearing the gun from the holster, or are you applying some forward pressure before the gun clears to flip yeah. the gun forward? Jeff Heath from Sacramento, long time Quinn member. 
alumni. Good morning. I haven't heard from you for a long time, Matt, so nice to hear from you. I hope, hope you're doing good. So to answer your question, Jeff, it, to, that's a great question, folks. Let me let me do it like this, okay? So if you watch my draw process, the second I index the handgun and attack it from the rear, I'm going to start to pull the gun out of the holster. But while I'm, I'm pulling the gun out of the holster, I'm pushing the gun forward. So I have a little bit of forward pressure on the gun. And the second the gun clears the holster, watch it pop out. It'll go pop. Okay, the second that happens, because I have a, just a little bit of forward pressure on the gun, and then that pops out, and the second that happens, I drive the gun straight toward the target. So I am, I am pulling the gun enough to clear it from the holster, but the gun is moving forward the second it clears the holster. And Jeff, a side note on that, when you're working on that, just make sure your front sight doesn't, doesn't hang up on your holster, you know, that you don't pull too hard and flip, you know, the gun out of the holster. If you, and I know you understand what I'm saying because you've been in the multiple class of mine. But, yes, I am, I'm applying slight forward pressure, and the moment the muzzle clears the holster, the gun is driving on a straight line to the target. <clears throat> All right, Mike. Tanya says, do you adjust your grip based on the action of the gun, i.e. a Glock side twist versus a SIG straight back recoil? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't feel that there's a difference in a Glock side twist or SIG straight back recoil. I don't feel that. Who is that? Ton, ton. Um, I, I, I don't think most humans have the ability to feel that torque. If you are, I'm very, very, very surprised. I think that's probably something that someone told you or something that might be in your head. So no, I, I pressure the Beretta. The exact same way I pressure a Glock, the exact same way I pressure a SIG. Um, you know, almost all of these have probably a right twist type barrel uh, system. Um, maybe there's some torque, but I, I, at my level, having shot hundreds of thousands of rounds, if not millions, I can't tell the difference between a Glock twist or a SIG snap. Now, the gun's recoil different, but that has nothing to do with the twist of the gun. That has to do with the frame material. So, for example... You know, a polymer frame handgun will recoil and return different because the polymer frame is flexing versus a steel handgun frame or an aluminum handgun frame that flex different than a polymer handgun frame itself. But I, I crush the gun and pressure the gun pretty much the exact same way no matter what gun I'm shooting. Elke says, does your strong hand middle finger joint under the trigger guard ever get sore or swollen? Mine does from the hard pressure. It does. So, Elke, yeah, two, two things that I have, you can maybe see it. I have a little bit of a callus on my middle finger. That's from constantly driving that hand, that finger up into the bottom of the gun there, right? Um, the second thing, when I'm shooting a lot during the day, because of the rotation of the hands and how I'm crushing the gun with my support hand, I'm constantly pushing on those three fingers. These fingers actually get a little sore. So if you're not really, if you're not crushing those fingers during your grip building process, you're probably not gripping hard enough with your support hand. I'm showing this, this is a righty, but you know, be the, the same would be true as a lefty if I switched the gun to the other hand. It really doesn't matter. It's the same principle. So yes, my, my middle knuckle and my finger does get sore as I'm pressuring the gun down. I'm also, there's kind of a key secret area I'm trying to show the camera. I'm locking these fingers into the palm of my hand as well. So as the gun's trying to recoil, those fingers themselves are locking into the palm of my hand. A lot of little pressure is going on. Hey, <clears throat> look at that. And by the way, those of you that have shared, thank you for sharing. If you haven't shared it, click the share button real quick for us. But I'm my point to you at all watching this right now or listening is I'm, I'm still paying attention to all of these little things that I feel in the grip. Pro, trust me, promise, go to the range next time you go to the range. Don't think about any practice session. Don't think about any drill. Just shoot the gun. Build your grip, shoot the gun, and feel what it's doing. Feel where the pressure is. Feel where your fingers are locked together. Feel where the palms of the hands are on the handgun. Feel how the gun recoils in your hands. Change the pressure. Squeeze harder with your left hand. Squeeze harder with your right hand. Drive the palms together. Lock the fingers in the palm of the hand. Just feel what the gun is telling you. Uh, and then when you when you feel what the gun is telling you, watch what the sights in return confirm, because what it's telling you by feel happens before what you're going to confirm visually on the gun itself. OK, Craig, Craig says he's an IDPA sharpshooter trying to get to expert. What kind of part time to first shot should he be striving for? Yeah, that's funny. I get that question a lot, Craig. I don't know. There is no there is no part time as fast as you can. Right. And the reason I say that is it depends. 
What position? What gear are you wearing? What target size is it? Uh, are there non-threats in the area? Are there, are there, are there, you know, are there, is there something you need to lean around or move around or whatever else? I could tell you that uh, my first shot in most matches and most stages is probably a one, one. Sometimes it's a one second if we're not required to wear a concealment. Sometimes it's a one, two or one, three, if it's a little bit harder shot, maybe even longer if that first shot is a head shot, for example. But it depends on the target distance, target size and all the dynamics in the stage. I would I would tell uh, and there are some there are some part time goals. If you go to my website and check out the IDP master program, Craig, there are some part time goals in the dry fire drills that I that I, I put down. So people have kind of a goal to set. But I am I'm a, <clears throat> I, I hesitate to give specific part time or number goals because folks, I think, find I'm going to make that number. And then that number is the number. In reality, we should be trying to experience improvement every single time and find out how we can guarantee a hit. For me, I would rather guarantee a first shot zero on a stage on the first target. I'd rather have that guarantee that that first shot is going to be a zero and give up a little bit of time than try to go really, really fast or have a really, really fast time and not be able to shoot that zero. Because the second you drop one point, one second, that's one second, right? Think about that for a second. It's one second the second you, you shoot a non-zero on IDPA. So if, if I shoot a non-zero, if I, if I drew two tenths faster, it doesn't matter. Who cares? I just dropped a point, right? So think about it that way. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Daniel says, quick question. I have issues shooting small guns. I shoot my Glock 17 to 34 just fine, but when I shoot my Glock 43, my shot placement is inconsistent. I've noticed that if I put my trigger finger more in the tip, it helps, but wondering if you have any ideas what to work on. So, yeah, Daniel, smaller grip handguns are just harder to shoot. That's like, you know, if you, if you across the board, let's say we had one competitive division and everybody got to choose what they shot, they would all shoot large frame full length guns because they're easier to shoot, you know. But your, 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 uh, your thought process on your trigger finger position is, is possibly a key. Think about this. The, the smaller, the shorter the distance between the trigger finger and the grip of my finger, right, the more I might tend to rotate around the trigger. I'm not a fan of this trigger finger position. I would rather have my shooters in a trigger finger position that allows them to pull the trigger straight to the rear, where if I wrap too deeply around the trigger, I might influence and move the gun in that direction. So when you say more of the tip of your finger, I'm not an advocate of this necessarily either, although they're not right or wrong, just this is something to play with. Um, this might move the gun in this direction, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I personally like to get my students to pull the trigger on the handgun grip size where they can make contact with the direct front of the trigger pad. I don't want to pull on the side of the pad on either side. I want to pull on the front of the pad because if you pull straight to the rear on the front of the pad, you're, gonna, you're moving the gun straight to the rear, but you're not pulling the gun off at an angle which might move the gun. Understand very clearly though, the culprit, 99 times out of 100, is not your trigger finger. It's your gripping fingers, right? That's the problem. But play with that trigger finger position a little bit. I think that's probably a, an intelligent way to approach it, okay? Thanks, Mike. Tony has a question. How much do you practice your concealed carry live fire shooting on average per year? Oh, good question. So, Tony, uh, so uh, to answer your question, Tony, I, every time I teach a class, if you were to teach my, t uh, take my defensive handgun class, I would actually be wearing my defensive handgun exactly like I wear it. So every time I teach a class or do a demo, I'm practicing that draw process. But I'll give you a great example. Like yesterday, I went to the range. I practiced with this rig. I actually practiced with my USBSA rig. Ooh, the dark side. But I practiced with this gun and a very similar holster. And at the end of all my practice sessions, I put my concealed carry handgun on. I might not even shoot but I'll work a series of draws from my appendix position. I'll just work on drawing the handgun and clearing the garment. It's not super fast. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm getting out of the holster like I should. So I don't spend a ton of time doing that. I would say I probably spend 70% of my time doing purely competitive stuff or different drill stuff and maybe 20 to 30% of my time with my true defensive rig. But the reason for that is, you know, a, a maybe 40 or 50% of my classes are defensive classes and I'm demoing every draw, every drill, every time with my actual carry gear. So I get a lot of repetitions in there. 
Steve says, when you are using an optic, how early in the presentation can you see the dot on the target? Yeah, I actually saw that question earlier, Steve. So when I, when I draw the handgun, I'll, I'll slow this down. So when I, when I get the gun in front of my face, so about right there, the optic is coming into my window. The optic is slightly high left. And the reason for that is that if you think about the draw path of the handgun, you could probably actually kind of see where I might see the dot. So if I'm looking through the window, right, you could probably see my little eyeball, and the dot is on the camera right now. The dot leaves the window about there, right? So assuming I, I have what I call planed out the handgun, the handgun is moving in this position, in, into position, I'll see the dot earlier. If you have the handgun that's dramatically high, you'll not see the dot till there. Because, you know, if you think about this, can I get the dot on the camera? Under here. There it is. If I do a little bit of an angle, left, right, or up or down, the dot's out of the window. So the key point is, how do you figure out? And I, th I think I answered your question, Steve. But the, you know, the point is, when I'm practicing with a dot, you know, I'll I'll find the dot, right? And I'll just come off the target, and find the dot, come off the target, find the dot, and I'm finding the dot by looking through the window. There's a dot. There's a dot. There's the dot. Okay, but that's where I actually see the dot. I hope that answers your question. All right, Gary says, <clears throat> did you ever consider shooting left-handed since your master eye is your left eye? Never. I never considered that, and here's why. You're, you're, you're not as strong with your support hand. You know, we call it a strong and weak hand for a reason. It, one is actually stronger because you do everything with your strong hand. And when I really started shooting, 99.9% .9 of the handguns were all right-hand manipulations. So for me to have to mess with releasing with my index finger and doing all kinds of stuff like that, just because my left eye was dominant, completely irrelevant. And by the way, cross dominance, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Hear me this time, everyone listening, if you're cross dominant, you're awesome because you're like me. It doesn't make a bit of difference. If I take the, the gun and put it from my left eye versus my right eye, right? There's just not a lot of difference in the position, right? There's a couple inches in difference. That's all. So the, the position of my hands and what my hands are doing on the handgun, these things are really important things. Which I am with, not so much. Doesn't really matter to me. I don't care. All right, Mike. Frank says, do you think the cool fire recoil is the same as a live round? Yeah, good question, Frank. Cool fire recoil depends on the system, right? So, and if you actually go to cool fire, which is about 30 minutes away from me right now, they, those guys have these uh, like uh, welding canisters filled up with CO2. So when they fill their barrels up, be careful of that. Don't blow yourself up, by the way. They have a you know, true full pressure fill of the gun itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, remnants of the virus. But if I were to fill this bad boy up, and this Tipman paintball canister is not quite as full as it could be. Like this one I've been using for months now. Maybe cool if I was watching, they'll send me one. But when I fire this, right, that... That's pretty darn, that's almost identical to what I would feel on this handgun if I shot it live fire. It's a little bit different recoil cycle. Um, I do have a Glock 19 with a cool fire barrel in it that if you picked your, my Glock 19 up and had lube on it and stuff, and you pick my live fire handgun, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It would, most of you couldn't tell the difference. I might feel a little difference, but most of you probably wouldn't feel much of a difference. So. It's very, very, very close on most of the guns, uh, but it's not exactly the same. Alan says, using an optic, should the dot come from 6 o'clock or 12 o'clock? Good question. So it depends. So I'm not, well, let me, let me, let me answer like this. If, if we present the gun on a straight draw, I want you to watch this, okay? So I'm going to slow this down. So the gun starts moving in a straight line, right? I'm going to index. And as soon as possible, I want to get the optic planed out. So I would like to have the gun in this position. I don't want to bring the gun up in front of my face and then plan it out. I don't want to bring the dot in front of my face and then plan it out because those are both slow. It takes me time to find the dot. But if I get the gun planed out here, the second the optic is in front of my face, I'll see the dot. Because <clears throat> think about this. The dot is transmitted to the glass, right? <clears throat> So if the gun comes in front of my eye like this, the dot will be there quicker. So the, the answer to your question is because of how my hands and, and arms are built, 
you can watch. It's very hard for me to get the gun planned out until about here, right? So that automatically means, right, that the dot at this position, right, okay, is, is, is not in front of my view, right? So if I, there's the dot right there. So as I'm coming down, the angle of my muzzle is down. So I'm going to show you very specific. So as I'm coming back to the holster, muzzle goes down slightly, right? So the dot pretty much has to come in from the top of the optic. The only way the opposite would be to true, you know, the, 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 the opposite would be, what, if you were to try to bring the dot up like this, so maybe I draw and go like this, then I have a hard time finding the dot, right? So my dot comes in from the top of the optic, to answer your question. I tried to show that visually on the camera. I don't know if I did or not. So. <laughs> Our good friend Jay Fujimoto is on from Hawaii. He has coin number 188. And if you want to know what a coin number is, please check out American Warrior Society. And let's see, uh, Ivan says, are, are you left eye dominant, cross eye dominant, what? So I'll go ahead and answer that. <laughs> Mike's right-handed and, uh, and left eye dominant, so he's cross dominant. I'm not, cross dominant. <laughs> that's not, that's cross eye dominant, Ivan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, cross dominance is where you're right-handed, left eye dominant. So I'm right-handed, left eye dominant. Yeah. Stefan says, in your grip, do you tense in a specific way your support hand elbow? That's a great question. So in my grip, when I, when I built the grip, so if you watch my grip, I'm going to build my grip without the handgun. That's where the gun stops, right? So right there, I've tensed my bicep and tricep, and I've locked this joint up. But there's a slight bend in my elbow, okay? I want that slight bend so when I shoot, the gun recoils in like this, not like this. The gun is recoiling like this, the sights stay in front of my vision better than if the gun recoils like this. I want the gun recoiling like this versus like this. So I have a slight bend in my elbow, but once I stop the gun, <clears throat> there's a pressuring or a, it's, you know, it's like a boom, stopping of a punch, I guess, maybe, right? If that's a good analogy, the gun stops on target like that. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Anthony wants to know, Mike, what size red dot do you use? That's a great question. Anthony, this is a, uh, in the, in the um, Delta Point Pro, it's a 2.5 minute. They, and I, I keep talking about this and I haven't got one yet. The uh, Delta Point is, I think they make a six minute or a five minute dot. Someone help me out on that final link or whatever. I'm going to get a bigger dot and try that. I think a bigger dot is going to be slightly faster than a smaller dot. Now this has the the intensity and the brightness is all the way up to the delta point. It works well for me, but I would suspect, I don't know yet, I would suspect I'm going to like the, the bigger dot better. So I probably would go to a five or six. I know some of the guys back in the day were shooting eight or 10 minute dots. I think that might be too big for me, but I don't know. Now in the Holosun optic, I have the circle and the center dot turned on. So they have a multi-reticle multi system that I like to turn on. I turn them both on. I have the whole circle of I can do for quick acquisition, but I can use the little dot in the center for a harder shot if I need to use a harder shot. Okay. And Mike, I believe that answers Tony's question. He says when choosing an optic, is, is a dot better or a circle dot? Yeah. So Tony, I think I just, just answered your question yeah. as well. If I have the option, I actually keep them both on. Debbie says, do you like the cool fire system better than the Mantix X10? And if so, why? So, Debbie, if I understand, I, I do have some mantises. I haven't done a lot with them. The mantis uh, it goes in the gun and gives you analysis on your trigger pulling and the gun movement and stuff like that. I think it probably provides some really good information. But, you know, the Cool Fire Trainer is a completely different tool. And correct me if I'm wrong, I maybe misunderstand the mantis in that now I get the felt recoil and the movement of the handgun itself, right? So I get to, if I want to work on, you know, resetting the trigger at speed, I can work on trigger reset at speed. You know, I get, I get sight movement on the gun itself. So I get to see what my sights are doing. I get to work on multiple shots. Um, you know, I could put a, the laser emitter on the front of the barrel if I want to and use a laser registering target if I want or one of the targets that Cool Fire sends with it. So to me, it's a completely different tool than the Mantis system, uh, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Guile, our friend Guile out there in the Philippines, Mike, he says, I'm just curious, Mike and Rich, do you guys prefer iron sights or optics? Red dot sights what? Oh, Guile, I don't, I can't tell you that I prefer either, man. Um, I don't, I do I prefer, 
That's a great it question. De- it depends, doesn't it? It really depends on purpose. I, I will. I, te- I will tell you this. Yeah, I, I do. I like red dots better because I'm at I'm at the age of 50 years old now, where <clears throat> I can't focus on the iron side as clearly as I want to, and the red red dots give me lots of information about the gun movement that I might not see in the iron sight. So it makes me a better shooter. Shooter Shooting a, a red dot on a handgun, if you even never decide to carry or compete with a, a red dot, will make you a better shooter, believe it or not. So because it, the dot shows you movement of the handgun that you might not see with the iron sights on the handgun themselves. Jeff says, do you find the dot versus iron sight presentation and visual pickup of the site is different enough that you should only stick with one platform type for competition and defense? Yeah, boy, Jeff, great question. I can't say that for a fact. Uh, I think the real answer there is how much time are you willing to dedicate to practice and training? You know, I'm so, I'm, I'm not pretty sure. I'm 100% certain. I can draw, draw my defensive handgun. I can find the sights enough to fire a decent shot. I can also put a different handgun in my holster and draw the sights enough to find the dot. But I would tell you, if you had to pick one or the other and you you don't have the time, the money, the ability, the, the desire to train a bunch, you're probably better off sticking with iron sights that are always in your visual view when you extend the handgun. Think about that. When I bring the iron sights in front of my eyes, they're always in my vision. I can always see exactly where the iron sights are. They may not be perfectly lined up. But I can always see where the iron sights are. Where the optic... When it comes in front of my face, I may not be able to find the optic until the window is completely in front of my eye and I'm looking through the window itself. When I say the window, I'm talking about the glass and the optic. So if you, you know, to make that decision, Jeff, I would say that if, if someone is not willing to train, they're probably better off sticking to iron sights and being really good with iron sights and not trying to shoot an optic or dot. You know, I would say I suspect the average defender that thinks they can put a dot on their carry gun and just find it automatically without lots of presentation practice will probably fail under stress. And, and Mike, Johnny wants to know how you acquire a coin. Mike, if you want to tell him that. Why don't you, why don't you answer that one, Rich? We'll have a sip of water, man. I've been talking a lot this morning. You have been talking a lot. Uh, well, to John's question, if you, Johnny, if you want to check out how you become a coin member of the American Warrior Society, Go to AmericanWarriorSociety.com. We have a 14-day free trial on us and find out if becoming a member of our self-defense community is the right thing for you. Um, let's see. We got some – Craig asked a question. Mike says, are there ACSS discounts for the cool fire? Uh, there, it's not an ACSS discount, but there is a cool fire discount. All of their discount codes. We've got to, I got to combine websites, folks. Sorry about that. Rich and I have been talking about that for a year. We're going to do that eventually. But if you go on to our podcast website, AmericanWarriorShow.com, right there on the right, you'll see all of the discount codes for the cool fire and precision holsters and stuff like that. I don't know what the cool fire discount is. It's not huge. They don't have a ton of margin in it, but uh, tell them C-Clander sent you and there's a discount code there. Andy says red dot or green dot? Ooh, good question, Andy. Great question. I don't have any handgun green dots. I don't know of anybody that makes one. I don't know if uh, I don't know if uh, Holosun makes a green variant for their small handgun sets. But all of my handgun optics are red dots. I do have green and red for my PCC and my AR optics. I have the 510CG and the 510CR or whatever it is, the red one and the green one. I can't tell you there's a big difference. The green one looks almost more yellowish, which in theory should be faster for me to visually pick it up. They're both illuminated dots. I can't tell you there's a difference. I'd probably default to the red one just because that's what I'm the most used to. I, I don't but you're know. red, green, colorblind, bro. I am red, green, colorblind, but I can see red. So that doesn't mean I can't see red or I can't see green. Uh, I see yellow better than I probably see variants of green. But once again, I can still see them all. Uh, even though I have, you know, when we, red, green, color blindness, oftentimes is a shade issue. So if you took a red, dark red something and laid it out in dark green grass, I would not pick it up right away. I might not be able to see it at all for a second. Wow. Eric says that the Cool Fire is compatible with the Mantix X using the CO2 setting for those that are interested. Mm, okay. But I'm, hey, the Mantis X, I think, is a fantastic tool. I just don't use one a ton of, for me to speak to necessarily. So. Uh, Mike says, hi, sir. Watching from the Philippines. How many years did it take for you to master your perfect grip? Oh, Mike, that's a great question. I'm not, I haven't mastered it yet. Right. Uh, if there's, you know, I'll repeat. Well, my good buddy, Rob Latham always says, if I had to complain about anything right now, I'm just not good enough. My grip is not good enough. 
I, my grip and my ability to hold the handgun good is not as good as I want to. So I have not mastered it yet. Maybe ask me next year. We'll see. <laughs> Julie says I'm new to the red dot. The dot is shaky for me and throws me off. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Julie, welcome to the club. The, yeah. the dot is not shaky. You are shaky. What happens is, you know, because the dot transmits so much more information, the dot is showing you the movement of the handgun. I actually had a, a student in class uh, make a comment that, man, you know, when you shoot a red dot, it, the gun moves a lot more. No, <laughs> the gun does not move a lot more. You just see a lot more of the movement because of the red dot. So that red dot is simply showing you the movement in your hands. Uh, just be aware of that. And that, that's the great thing. That the, the bad news is the red dot is showing you the movement in your hands. The good news is the red dot is showing you the movement in your hands. So you can move to correct that and you can work on stabilizing the gun better and not moving it when you pull the trigger. Because as we all know, when we make a mistake in shooting, it's because we move the gun when we pull the trigger. By the way, you can be a very, very good shot and still be very shaky, right? As long as we're not moving the gun when we're firing it. Daniel says, are there any red dots that are better for astigmatism or do you have any tips to help with that starburst effect from the dot? Man, Daniel, I'm sorry. I... I can't tell you a red dot that might be different for astigmatism versus not. I don't have one. I have had a couple of students that I've talked to about that, but I've not experienced that visually. So I, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you there, man. I'm sorry. That's one of the few things I can't answer, but I don't know if there's one that's better for astigmatism than others. I have heard some students say when they turn the intensity down on the dot, that helps that a little bit. So maybe consider adjusting your intensity on your optic down a few notches and see if that helps. Yeah, Gal says, I remember Rich mentioning we should also adapt to the optic sights. I'm willing to learn. I just need to save up for a new gun. Yeah, I don't I don't remember saying that, but I think I've had to do that because of my aging eyes. So your 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 experience may vary. Yep. Julie says, I have a CQB Elite coming with the green fiber optics, but not the dot. Ivan says, have you tried and compared any red dot sights installed in the slide versus an RDS installed on open guns with fixed RDS rails? Which tracks better? Uh, so Ivan, I would assume you're talking about the difference between mounting the red dot, a slide mounted red dot or a frame mounted red dot. So uh, a frame mounted red dot is going to track differently than a slide mounted red dot. Because think about this, a frame mounted red dot that's only mounted to the frame is simply going to move in the angle that the gun is recoiling. The slide mounted red dot actually moves toward you, up and then back, toward you, up and back. So there's a different pulse in terms of the red dot. The a frame mounted red dot tends to look like it shoots a little flatter and you'll see less motion, but there's not a ton of difference between the two. This is uh, Heather says for beginners, how often do you practice? Uh, boy, for beginners, how often do I practice? So if, are you asking me, Heather, how much should you practice as a beginner or how much do I practice? I practice at a minimum. I'm on the range three days a week and I drive fire probably closer to five days a week. Right. Uh, as a beginner, I think you should practice. Here's the answer. I think you should practice as much as you can. But understand that practicing doesn't mean you're going to the range and shooting live ammo if you can't afford it. Practicing might mean you invest in a cool fire trainer like we've shown on this show or dry fire or working on your manipulations or whatever else. We can work on drop process, reload process, manipulations of all kinds, malfunction clearing processes and dry fire to the point where your, your manipulation of the handgun is very, very, very good. Then when you go to the range, you work on recoil control. You work on grip trigger sights and keep it simple and then work as much as you can, as much as you can afford, you know, and, and a lot of folks are like, well, ammo is expensive, Mike. I understand that. But depending on why you're practicing, it, it, it might be expensive. But, you know, uh, I used to have a buddy that used to say, so is a funeral, right? Funeral is expensive as well. So if you're practicing for your self-defense purposes, spend the time you can getting better with your handgun. And Jeff asked a really good question. He says, does Rich apply wax to your dome? for just optical shine effect or also aerodynamic efficiency. That's, That's cool, Jeff. It's uh, aerodynamic and it's, uh, well, as you can see, it's got some beautiful shine to it as well. Uh, let's see, Mike, we have another one here. This is an interesting one. Gab says, how do you get sponsorships? Yeah, great question, Gab. Uh, 
train for 20 plus, 25 <laughs> years, take about 15 different firearms classes, dry fire six to seven days a week, spend hours reloading on your kitchen table. And eventually, once you gain some skill, uh, start to talk to some of the companies that, that you use. Hey, this is my favorite gun, the one I compete with. This is my favorite holster, the one I compete with. This is my favorite belt. This is my favorite timer. Call them and say, hey, I love your stuff. I'd love to represent you. What would that take? We'll go from there. Uh, Mike, I think that's it. Heather says, thank you so much. I love watching this class. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that, folks. Wow, man, this was an incredible show. We still have 112 live viewers on right now, which is fantastic, mm -hmm. folks. This is going to get lots and lots of views throughout the day. So I'll summarize with a couple of things. We talked about a bunch of keys to the grip building process. I, I gave you some secrets in the beginning of the video. If you're watching this now and you're just jumping on, rewind it because I gave some counter rotating tips and some grip crusher tips that I think that'll that'll really dramatically improve your recoil control. We also talked about the the feeling process versus the seeing process of you know the draw process. I would I was going to get to the load today, but how about this? How about next week? We talk about speeding up the load, and then I'll do some more Q&A on what we did this week. So we'll talk about the draw a little more, but we'll focus entirely on the load. If you want IDPAers, I'll also teach you some of the secrets on the reload with retention and how you get that magazine in your pocket and switch the magazines out a little faster. So if you join me next week, Wednesday morning, I believe, 730, I'll be live again, and we'll talk about that. I also talked about chunking breaking the draw or the load or whatever skill you're working down into small chunks and repetitively working those chunks as perfectly as you can to learn from them. You don't have to do a big, long drill to learn. Do a small chunk and then try to learn from that chunk and improve upon that small chunk. Work on your manipulation skills in dry fire. Do them at home. Work on your draw. Work on your reload. Work on your angles. Work on your positioning. Work on hand position, grip pressure. Work on that at home. And then when you go to the range, Use some of those fundamentals drills, you know, the five-shot group drill, the one-shot extend prep or press drill, the five-shot pace drill to make you that much better. Don't forget to check out the products. Of course, we showed off the Cool Fire Trainer if you want to work on resetting the trigger path. Cool Fire Trainer will help you do that. We talked about the holster system that I use. Of course, my signature line, if you go to Precision Holsters, if you love the stars and stripes, that's the signature line. Strongly recommend you check that out. It's right there on the homepage. That's precisionholsters.com. Click on sequence or signature line. Um, last but not least, give me a follow on Instagram, please. I'm trying to build up my Instagram page. I'm posting some very, very good, I think good, because people like them, one-minute tips. So give me a follow. Send me a message. Hey, Mike, I saw you on Facebook Live this morning. Uh, Mr. Rich Brown has a show on Friday morning, 7.30 a.m., he calls it Coffee with Rich. We turn it into a podcast. It's a great show. If you want to jump on Friday morning, please jump on. Next week, I would love to beat our record today and see if we can hit 200. Who thinks we can hit 200 live viewers next week? We had 153 today? Is that yeah, crazy? I saw 157, I think, at one 157 point. 157 live viewers today. Just, uh, Mr. Rich Brown, what do you have to close with? Anything to close with before we end it? Yeah, I do. Uh, John and Will both asked. And I think it's interesting for people that the answer is, is there going to be a Zoom session tomorrow night, Thursday nights at 530? We do Zoom sessions with our members. Maybe you could explain that and answer that question as well. Yeah, good question. So, John, all of you coin members, all of you ACSS members that have access to the vault, the Q, actually Q&A session will be tonight. I can't do it tomorrow night because I'm on a trip to uh, 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 southern Oklahoma with my wife. So Q&A tonight, join me. Let's talk about what that is. That means that uh, if you're a member, you can log into an area we call the vault. The vault has all of the training programs. If you're a competitive member, you get access to six or seven different programs, 29 different uh, videos, the performance enhancement section, stage breakdown, movement. If you're AWS member, you get even more, all of the medical stuff, all the edge weapon, all the combatives, all the shotgun stuff, all the handgun stuff. So if you're not a member, consider becoming a member. And last but not least, what our members do is they jump on a Q&A every Thursday night, typically. Of course, tonight is Wednesday night. Uh, and we open up and we have a question like this. The difference is where right now you can see me in our Q&A, I can see the members. So if they have a hand in their hand and I'm teaching them something, I can actually look at what they're doing and give them feedback on the technique or the drill that they're working on. Okay, We do a lot of mental Q&A, a lot of discussion. Once again, it's members only. Um, but it'd probably be worth joining for two weeks just to check out a member's Q&A and see what that's like. So that's it. Uh, Mr. Rich, anything else you want to close with, brother? 
Nope, that's it, Mike. All right, folks, that's all I have. Hey, Miss Chris, thank you very much for sharing. And for those of you that shared and liked and did all that stuff, that really helps drive the folks in to watch this. I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed teaching it. Uh, and don't forget, folks, until then, train hard.